they were graven with an iron pen and hewn in the rock forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, that he will stand at the latter day upon the earth, though after my skin worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, mine own eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and was raised, that he may be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Thou dost show us the path of life. In thy presence there is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Weeping may tarry for the night as joy comes in the morning. The eternal God is our dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. If a man dies, shall he live again? Of all the days of my appointed time, will I wait until my change comes? Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou art formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou turnest man to destruction. A return, O children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight, as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Thou cast as in a flood, they are as asleep. In the morning, they are like grass which groweth up. And it for who knoweth the power? And right now, as the covered body is being wheeled out of the sanctuary here at Zion Baptist Church, Robin Morrison speaking final words of blessing over the body. As they make their way out of the church onto Shirley Street, where the procession is waiting to begin the march to Weston Cemetery. A very noteworthy, somber yet significant day for the country. Yes, it is giving us a chance to reflect on what it really means to put country and service above self. If we can say nothing else, we can say that Sir Clifford was someone who was altruistic, who was, who was selfless in all aspects of the word. He went beyond the call of duty, and it certainly gives us a great deal of pride to see his body being draped in the national flag, you know, looking at the triangle, which represents the progressiveness of a Bahamian people. And we could say that the man from Chester Sacklands has certainly been one who epitomizes what it means to work for the good of a nation in a progressive manner. So, Shanique, we're going to see, we are seeing now the body being taken out of the sanctuary. For the final time, we say goodbye as parishioners, as congregants here at Mother Zion. We say goodbye to our own Sir Clifford, fallen brother, usher, activist, in this local assembly, a faithful servant of God who served his congregation, who served his people, and who served his God. Of course, this service will continue in the intimate stage at the Western Cemetery, and that is where final words of blessings and prayers will be expressed there by Reverend Morrison 
and a team of clergymen. That's right, from this local assembly, the Reverend Leon Johnson, one of the senior members here, one of the senior leaders, will be leading off in the committal service at the Western Cemetery. He will be assisted by the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Roll, who will help to perform the committal rites. We'd like to say, of course, we've been joined all morning and into this afternoon by listeners on 1540, listening in all over the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands. We certainly welcome you. And, you know, hundreds of people, of course, are now trying to make their way out of the sanctuary here from all areas of this, uh, this huge uh, edifice upstairs and throughout and many of them, no doubt, of course, wanting to be a part of the procession or perhaps even beat the procession and, and make their way to Western Cemetery so that they too can just be there as the last rites are declared over Sir Clifford's remains. So many persons have made the sacrifice of moving away from their normal duties, their workplaces on this occasion, just to be here to celebrate the homegoing of Sir Clifford. We see uh, passing us by a number of school principals who attended the ceremony and yes we do have the color guard the royal bahamas police force officers defense force officers now taking the body of our late departed brother sir clifford down the steps of mother zion of course we have been here on this very same location for decades in fact for more than 176 years but as history is being recorded today, this is the first opportunity that we have had to host a state funeral. Sad though be the occasion, we rejoice, we celebrate, because we know that our brother is in a better place. I was amazed and unimpressed by the strength of a great lady darling, so composed, uh, just a true matriarch of the darling family, even as she mourns the passing of her husband, Certainly, the, the family of Zion, the extended family, just sort of around her this afternoon, supporting and praying for her. Well, of course, it is scriptural when we know that after you've done all you can, all you need do is stand. It is good to know that you've given your best, you've done your all. As we heard reflected from one of the speakers on the platform, that she has been at his side for four decades, for 42 years, she has been at his side. And so having done what you have, could have done, there is no need for regret. He will be sadly missed. But there are some precious memories, I'm sure, which are holding her today as she stands firm as Lady Ingrid, Ingrid Darling. Of course, our coverage will continue at the Western Cemetery. Uh, we will, our, new, our team led by Anthony Newbold, will of course have the coverage there as Sir Clifford's remains are, like if laid to rest for a final time, are interred. We are wrapping up our coverage here at the church as we see the Commission of Police along with the Commodore of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force sharing words with former Speaker of the House, Member of Parliament for South Eleuthera, as they too make their way out of the Zion Baptist Church. And they all, of course, will meet at the Western Cemetery. A really a wonderful service, very fitting, very respectful, yet, of course, sharing and, and showing us many of the things that Sir Clifford himself enjoyed coming here, many of the features coming here and attending the Zion Baptist Church for 50 plus years. Uh, many of the hymns he, he would have sang himself uh, as a congregant, uh, certainly requesting, as he edited as we understand, he had a hand in sort of planning this final service this afternoon. Um, but really, really a fitting service for a statesman. And it is also a fitting statement of what it means to live and how it is we ought to die that we ought to anticipate the moment because we all ought to be preparing we are pilgrims on a journey passing through and once you would have prepared yourself for it then you just need to embrace the moment as Sir Clifford did
You're now looking at live shots on Shirley Street where uh, Sir Kilford's body is being hoisted onto a waiting carriage. Uh, a number of people, of course, lining the streets, just wanting to watch. And of course, he was also um, a part of, of a bigger body as well, a, a number of a, a lodgemen. I don't know the name of the lodge right off hand, but certainly a, a good uh, representation of them here this afternoon and all waiting to partake in the final procession leading to Weston Cemetery. Our coverage will pick up at Weston, but for now we will send it back to the station with Jerome Sawyer as this crowd here made up of government and opposition and civic and religion and also just dear friends of Sir Clifford get ready to participate in a final procession to Weston Cemetery. Jerome, I'll send it to you. Thank you very much, Shanique Miller, who was um, inside Zion Baptist Church for the funeral portion of this state funeral for the late Sir Clifford Darling, former Governor General, Cabinet Minister, Speaker of the House, and Parliamentarian. You would have seen there a lengthy Baptist funeral held for the Governor General, the late Governor General, um, he being, the, of course, the only Governor General to be of the Baptist faith to be buried, um, certainly, and from that church. We are also going to be extending our coverage this afternoon for the interment part of today's state funeral. As you would have heard Shanique Miller mention there, Anthony Newbold is a part of this broadcast as well. He is stationed at the Western Cemetery on Nassau Street, one of the oldest cemeteries in the country. Certainly, um, whenever you hear the Western Cemetery mentioned, you would know that um, that is a graveyard that is strictly reserved for older families who would have had plots there for some time, giving you an idea really of, of uh, Sir Clifford's heritage. But our Anthony Newbold is standing by at the graveyard where the procession bringing Sir Clifford's body will be making its way there shortly. Anthony, what can you tell us from this point uh, from your perspective? Well, Jerome, what I can tell you is uh, the Snow White mausoleum waiting to accept the mortal remains of Sir Clifford is ready and uh, Sir Clifford will be surrounded in death by some of the other prominent residents of the Bahamas who made equally important and invaluable contributions to the development of this country. And we think of some of the names in the Western Cemetery. In fact, right next to Sir Clifford's mausoleum, just to the south, Sir Osborne Bancroft. He was, ironically, Chief Justice from 1946 to 1951. I'm sure Sir Clifford and Sir Osborne very well could have had occasion to talk to each other about labor matters or just matters in general. Just to the east of Sir Clifford's mausoleum, late Dr. J. Wavell Thompson. Think of the names in the Bahamas who've made contributions, well, it's Bethel's, Sawyer's, Feely Demerit, the late mortician, Uriah McPhee, whose death occasioned the 1968 elections that allowed the PLP to con establish and, and set it's, it's hold on the Parliament of the Bahamas. So any number of prominent Bahamians uh, buried here in the Western Cemetery where the mortal remains of Sir Clifford will be committed in just a short period of time. Jerome? Coming to us in the Western Cemetery, coincidentally, my grandparents are buried in the Western Cemetery, as many other family members. I'm joined uh, for this portion of the broadcast by Patty Roker, Many of you know her voice um, quite distinctly from Island FM. But, Patty, I want to welcome you to the broadcast. We thought to bring you on as you helped Sir Clifford um, pen one of two books, the first one being Sir Clifford Darling, A Bohemian Life Story, Volume 1. I understand Volume 2 is still in progress. We're going to talk about that a little later. But certainly welcome to the broadcast on this very somber occasion, but we're certainly happy to have you here. Well, we are going to talk quickly about the route, first of all, from Zion to the Western Cemetery. If you'd like to catch the procession, and if you're in the immediate area, just to give you an idea, also if you want to avoid the area, as you can imagine, traffic is going to be pretty um, hectic right now. The procession appears to be leaving Zion at this hour, but it will proceed west on Shirley Street to Princess Street, 
west on Princess Street to Duke Street and west on Duke Street to Cumberland Street, north on Cumberland to Marlborough Street. It will then continue west on Marlborough Street to West Bay Street, west along West Bay Street to Nassau Street, traveling in a southern direction to the Western Cemetery, where his body will then be interred. As you can see, those of you who are joining us by Channel 13 or streaming on the web, you can see there the um, police and defense force uh, on a guard accompanying the procession as they leave Zion headed ultimately for the Western Cemetery. We've got some time to talk a little before we actually um, get to the graveyard and turn it over to our Anthony Newbold uh, once again for the interment service. But Patty, I want to talk about um, Sir Clifford's book for a moment. Um, he like so unfortunately not like many but there have been some Bahamian statesmen like himself, others who've been involved in in, in, his, in the history of the Bahamas and the development of the country, decided to put pen to paper, as we would say, if we can use that cliche, and decided to, to put down uh, some things in a book. I want to talk about this volume one and really what went into it. Well, it, um, it was quite a journey because um, Sir Clifford has had, that's kind of hard to do, mm -hmm. had, a number of anecdotes, as many people who know him and who've listened to him over the years know, he he had great anecdotes about his life from childhood right on through. And it was our job, and I say our because Lady Darling was a major part of this, it was our job to take those anecdotes and set them up in a format that anyone could take this book and from anywhere and read it and know what the general strike was, what it meant to Bahamians at that time, could know what Burma Road, the Burma Road riots meant because he was a witness to that, could know what the contract was, not just the stories that he told, but actually set it up in the context of history. In a historical context. In yeah. a historical context mm -hmm. so that um, they would under his, his stories would then have greater meaning. So. Um, there was a lot of research that went into this, a lot of uh, very interesting research, like finding the first darling, which I thought would be really easy, but there was no first darling <laughs> until his grand, great, 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 great grand <coughs> was given property or bought property in Chester's. Let me, a man as humble as, as, as Sir Clifford Darling was, it would seem almost self-serving to write this book. Some people say, oh, I, I don't want to write a book because it's, you know, I don't, I don't want to promote myself. But it seemed almost out of character for him. What was it like sort of getting him to get into this, the mode of writing this book? I believe that credit goes entirely to Lady Darling because uh, I had always been sort of after her to say, you know, he's got such great stories. He's got, he's lived through so much because his life was almost like a microcosm of the 20th century history of the Bahamas. He, he'd been there for almost every major event, if not at the center at, on the periphery, as in Burma Road. And he, it, it, telling his story was telling the story of 20th century Bahamas. And I think she finally got him to see that his stories should be put down for future generations. And the way he felt about many things, which, uh, which come out in the book. Mm -hmm. He, since his death, I mean, the country has sort of reflected on his time as Governor General, we've reflected on his time as Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. as a Member of Parliament, um, to some degree as a Senator, um, also to his time um, within the trade union movement. But today, earlier in the broadcast, we were reminded, and I was even reminded, um, of his time on the contract mm. and his involvement in civil rights. And I remember I, the last time I interviewed him was in 2008, and he and I spoke um, at length about an experience he had at the height of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But this is the, the Clifford Darling I think a lot of people forgot. Oh, I believe that as I was listening to the broadcast this morning, I was thinking that Clifford Darling was the steel that was Clifford Darling was forged into unbreakable steel on the contract. As he saw the, there's a story in the book about him witnessing a, a service, a black serviceman being literally asked to leave a bus in the United States and him thinking that was, 
here's a man who's, who'd given his mm -hmm. time for his country, defending the country, and he was being treated in that manner. And he returned here determined, and it was a mantra almost, that he said it all the time, he would not become a second-class citizen in his own country because he had seen what being a second-class citizen was. And he was determined. He came back in 1946 determined that that would never happen to him. And then he started to see the Bahamas with different eyes and started to see what was happening here because as an island boy in Acklands, you don't experience discrimination because everybody is family or everybody it's is more in the about, same I guess it was boat. more about survival. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And there was no hierarchy. There was a commissioner and maybe a politician or two that came in election year or whatever. <laughs> but, I mean, everybody was the same. Mm -hmm. So he didn't experience this. Even in Nassau, he didn't really experience it. Or maybe even understand boy. to a certain degree. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. exactly. And but he saw it in America and he came back steel. It was mentioned during the church service and hopefully if we have time we're going to play it later on in the broadcast but one of the things opposition leader and Perry Christie talked about and we'll, we'll come to it later but the, the, one of the tragedies I guess of history is that the country either doesn't know or forgotten or cho chosen to forgotten the role he played in that general strike and how important he was. Totally. He they were tired of being passed over. They were tired, the taxi drivers, of getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning to queue up at the Oaks Field International Airport and only to have tour car drivers come and take their jobs. So they decided that when the new airport opened on November 2nd, 1957, they were going to blockade it. So if they had met the tour cars in place, and they met the tour cars in place, so they parked their cars, they locked their cars, they put the keys in a briefcase, gave the briefcase to um, uh, Clarence Bain. Clarence Bain then apparently, which I found out after we wrote the book, because Sir Clifford didn't know where that briefcase went. I found out that the briefcase, um, Dame Marguerite Pinling once said to me, you know, during the general strike, Clarence Bain showed up at my house with this briefcase and told me to hold on to it, and I don't know what was in it. And I went, I know what was <laughs> I in it. The keys. The keys. <laughs> so the keys were secure. And it was two days of negotiations um, before they agreed to move their cars and enter into eight weeks of uh, discussion on negotiation of 20 points. And they negotiated 19 of the points, and they couldn't agree on the 20th. And time ran out. And the, they had a meeting, as Sir Clifford said in the interview with Ace this morning, he had, they had a meeting, and Sir Randall didn't want to go for a general strike, but all of his unions under his banner said, oh, we're going for a general strike. With or without you, we're going for a general strike. The taxi drivers need us, it's time, we have to do this. So Sir Randall got on the bandwagon and there was the general strike, and Sir Cliff, Sir Cliff kept that general strike peaceful because he had seen Burma Road. He had seen what had happened during Burma Road. He would have also seen civil rights in the U.S. and what could happen. Well, there were plots, as he intimated, uh, some fellas, as he would say, some fellas had some dynamite that he got wind of. and stopped that. There were things that could have happened during that general strike and the army was here, the Navy, the Royal Navy was in the harbor. That could have gone up like a like dry tinder with a spark and he kept it peaceful so that rallies every night, everybody knew what they were supposed to do but nobody, nobody was violent. He then entered politics um, being one of the um, original members of parliament to be elected in 1967. Before that, he was um, he was in the first in, Senate. In, in the first Senate, in the first uh, this Senate is after, after the, the new constitution. Two PLP Senate. Um, one of the two, but he went on to, to win his seat in 67. But um, what you don't know about that is they told him that they didn't want him to run. That's why I love talking to you, Patty. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There's always they, some snippet of history. They told him they didn't want him to run and they told him if he ran and lost, they wouldn't put him back in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And he ran. 
And he won by 86% of the votes. And he never lost an election. I said, and he never from, lost. From the moment he was elected to represent the workers during the contract, to every single union election, to every general election, he never lost an election. I don't know how many other political figures few. can say that. Few, very few. I want to um, talk um, quickly, and we've got a, a clip that I, I want us to play in just a few moments. But in 1974, as the Minister of Labor and National Insurance, he was responsible for the introduction of the National Insurance Program, October 7th, 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a, a piece of forgotten history. I think a lot of people don't realize really how important his role was oh. in bringing about this thing that we call national insurance out of which so many other social programs have, have, have sprung and spun and continue to support us in so many ways. I was so pleased when I saw the clip this morning that uh, he was threatened. His life was threatened. People, people were very, very opposed to this idea of somebody coming and taking money out of my paycheck? I don't think so. Um, and he was threatened. And as he said to me, and as he said on the program this morning, um, I figure any man who wants to tell me he's going to kill me probably isn't going to kill me. <laughs> and those that are, those that will kill me aren't going to give me warning. So he was not concerned. And he had a very fatalistic, well, if it's my time, it's my time. And, um, God gave him 89 years. We're going to play a clip from the opening of the, um, or the naming, I should say, of the National Insurance Building in his honor. He spoke um, at that, on that occasion. We have that clip now. I'm going to play it now for the audience to listen in. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. You know, seeing this great gathering this afternoon, it seems as if you all come to celebrate my funeral. The songs that you sang and all the good things that are spoken about me, I feel as though I'm already dead. I thank all of those who spoke so highly about me. Protocol has been established already, so therefore I just will make my mark. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I must first give thanks to Almighty God for preserving my life this day, a day that I will never forget. When they sang a while ago, Great is Thy Faithfulness, I must give thanks to God for allowing me 84 years plus in this world. I thank the Bahamas government and the Honorable Minister of Health and National Insurance Dr. B.J. Nottage, for recognizing the contributions I've made to my country, especially the introduction of the National Insurance Program. We must never forget those Bahamians who made and are making great contributions to their country and to recognize them while they are alive. When I introduced the National Insurance Program, in the Honorable House of Assembly on the 7th of October, 1974, the opposition members opposed it. And when the employers began to deduct contributions from their employees' paycheck, I received telephone calls and unsigned letters threatening my life. I never reported these matters to the police. I believe then as I do now, that God will protect me. I told members of parliament that the National Insurance Program is the single most comprehensive piece of legislation ever to be introduced in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. It was designed to help 
the old age pensioners and to solve the day-to-day -day problems of the poor. The best thing we could give them is to help them to help themselves. We must give them the technical, social, educational, and political skills that will help them to get bread, human dignity, freedom, and strength by their own effort. My brothers and sisters, the National Insurance Program has come a long way since 1974, helping thousands of people. I thank Mr. C.A.P. Smith, who was my permanent secretary, the National Insurance Board, the entire staff of the International Labor Organization, ILO, from Geneva, who assisted us with the formation of the program and all those persons and organizations who work so hard. Without them, there would be no national insurance program. I thank all those persons who serve as ministers of national insurance, including you, Mr. Prime Minister, who succeeded me, the former Prime Minister, the Honorable Hubert A. Ingram, and Chairman for guiding this program along the way. The words of our national anthem, let us lift up our heads to the rising sun and march on until the road we trod lead to our God. My brothers and sisters, how can we march leaving our unfortunate brothers and sisters behind? We must hold their hand and carry them along. If not, when we reach to our God, he will ask, where are the others? That was from 2006, renaming of the NIB complex or the Clifford Darling complex. Patty, um, some of what we talked about going into that, um, that clip, um, he himself recalled, um, yeah. poignant he said, you know, at the beginning, it sounds as if I'm dead already. <laughs> And all of the wonderful things people obviously had to say about him. Of course, it was in 2006, Barry Christie was then Prime Minister, but he spoke to all of the people who helped to bring national insurance to the fore. I mean, even though he was a man who was being recognized for what he had done, um, for being the minister to bring this to Parliament and all the hard work that he had done, but yet he was still so grateful to everyone who had assisted. He, he, he felt that. Um, he remembered the people because he had literally that he, he saw that department built from uh, he recognized as you heard C.A.P. Smith who was his permanent secretary and people from this place and that place and civil servants that all came together to create this national insurance um, board and it was uh, he always felt that that was one of the highlights of his career really because that was he was always very conscious of, as you heard, when you get to heaven, they're going to, God will say, where are the rest, rest of them? Mm -hmm. what, what about them? And uh, he was always very conscious about the rest of them, you know, helping people. How did he view his time as Speaker of the House? Oh. I, <laughs> cool. I, I, I noted earlier that, that, you know, it was said that it was something he did reluctantly, but, you know, he did it for the team. Yeah, but he also, well, going back a bit, he was a deputy speaker he was in 67 right. under Alvin Brainin, and as such he was the first black man to sit in that chair and which was... Tell us a Stafford Stein <laughs> story. <laughs> well, this is a Sir Clifford Darling story and, and the, the, the visual of this is, is quite quite poignant. He said that he and Sir Stafford had had, had, had locked horns at, when he was with the taxi cab union many times. And uh, Sir Stafford had threatened all kinds of things and Sir Clifford said, frankly, I can go back to Acklands and, and fish and farm and I don't need to be here. I'm fine. So you could threaten all you want. But um, they had locked horns. They were not best of friends. So Sir Clifford tells about the first time that Sir Stafford had to, in leaving the chamber, make obeisance to the chair and look up and see this black Bahamian sitting in the chair for the first time who A wasn't his friend and B was representative of many things he it was a moment 
and we can all imagine that moment. And shortly thereafter, of course, Sir Stafford went into exile and died away. But then he became speaker, and his years as speaker... Of course, a lot transitioned from the time he was deputy to speaker. Oh, yeah, he was yeah, a he minister. He would have gone into cabinet. And, he yeah. was, yes, that was mm -hmm. a whole other interesting period of time. But when he became speaker, he was speaker during the um, Commission of Inquiry of the 80s, during the turbulent years, and just the characters that were in the House then, the Cecil Wallace Whitfields and the Pindlings, and uh, just think about the cast of characters that were in the House at that, and strong a strong violet. opposition forces as well. Very I mean, strong. You, you look Norman at, Solomon. Yeah, you look yeah. at some of the men and women who would have been in Parliament in those exactly. days. Exactly. And he would, one of the things I most admire him for, one of the speaker's uh, biggest weapons is to name a member, mm -hmm. which means that you have the ability as speaker to um, expel the member from the House for a period of time, an hour, a day, a month, whatever. Sir Clifford never named anyone, and he was very proud of it, irrespective of how badly they carried on. And in those days, there were no TV cameras. No TV cameras. <laughs> so they weren't but bound to But there were behave. reporters, you yes. remember, who yes. would sit there yeah. word for word. There yes. were, those were the days of the Athena yeah. Damianos. Yeah. Yeah. Gladstone Thurston. Gladstone Thurston. Mm -hmm. But he never named anyone because he said that is not fair to the people that elected them. That would leave those people without representation in this chamber. And that wasn't right. However, in order to speak, the speaker must acknowledge you, must look at you and acknowledge you, acknowledge you. He said that he didn't have to name someone. He just didn't have to look at them and acknowledge them for a period of time, <laughs> which made them, you know, they were there, they were representing the people, but they didn't have the opportunity to speak as much as they would have liked to. So he, he was... Um, the old adage, more than one way to skin a cat. More than one way to skin a cat. But he, he used a lot of prayer. He used a lot of, um, when things would get very rowdy, he would stand up and resign, you know, just, just walk out, and the house would be adjourned for a moment of time, and he would go down. I said, you'd go down and consult your books. He said, no. I'd usually go down and pray about it, and when I came back, I'd have the answer to whatever the dilemma was. But he was, um, he was a very strong speaker who, who had a very strong house. Mm -hmm. So he was, uh, it was an interesting time for him, I think. 1992, January 1992, he becomes Governor General. Mm -hmm. Just prior to the year of a change in government. August 19th. Yeah, from January to August, he was Governor General mm -hmm. under Progressive Liberal Party mm -hmm. government. Um, that all changed in August of 1992. Mm -hmm. What was that period like for him? Having <sighs> all of his political career been within the Progressive Liberal Party, but ascended to this high office of Governor General, but now suddenly, you know, the game has changed. You have a new prime minister, a new government. Exactly, but you have to understand that Sir Clifford, just as he had when he was speaker, because as speaker, he couldn't be biased. Mm -hmm. When he was governor general, he transcended party. It was how he felt personally. Um, I don't think it really, it really um, played into his emotions at the time because he was neither, he was nonpartisan. There was something, though, he, I, years ago as a, as a young reporter, um, I remember I was working on a piece for the Millennium, mm -hmm. and we were looking back at, at major moments in, in Bahamian history, and I, I interviewed him. And he said to me, and he, he reminded me at that time, and I never forgot the look on his face as he described it. In 1992, during the opening of Parliament, he was sent on vacation. Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to read the speech from the throne mm -hmm. as governors general do. Mm -hmm. In order that, um, I believe, Kendall Isaacs. Kendall Isaacs. Isaacs. Read the speech from the throne. Mm -hmm. He seemed very disturbed by that. He was. It was a great sadness to him. They were told they could go anywhere in the world. He went to Canada. They went to Canada. Sat in a hotel room. 
Do you think he ever reconciled? Do you think that with that? Do you think uh, that? Did you think he ever came to terms with that, that opportunity not being given to him? He was such a nationalist, and you've had the phrase "team player" used today. He was. He rose above it. The country needed him to be a governor general. Yes, he was upset. Yes, he was heartbroken. But he was the governor general. He came back, and he was the governor general. And he remained until 1995. Under an FNM government, which I'm sure at times must have been difficult for him. I mean, you've, all your life you've been associated and within the PLP. I mean, it's not something that hasn't happened since, but. No, but it's, it was. It was very tumultuous, and, and the way it was handled in '92 was. I don't. I don't think either party would probably do it the same way again. It's. Uh, it was very sad. But you forget the other tumultuous incident as he was speaker in 1987. They couldn't elect a speaker until like midnight because there were challenges on the floor. That was. A, we weren't sure if he would become speaker in 1987 because that, I believe, I believe, I can't remember, no, I'm not going to say it because I'm not sure, but <laughs> there was a challenge to him as speaker and there were votes and there was all kinds of ruckus and because I was outside in the square and it was like, okay, um, you're electing a speaker. Which is something that's I, almost, I mean, it's procedural nowadays. Yeah, I mean, you is. know the speaker is before you go yeah, in. On, and on, and on, into the night. Interesting, interesting. Our procession now steadily making its way towards the Western Cemetery um, for that um, final committal ceremony. Um, we're going to the Western Cemetery for the final committal, which is um, about to take place. It looks like they are inside the, ce the cemetery um, at this time. Uh, we're going to check in with our um, Anthony Noble in just a few moments, but we're uh, not quite ready yet. While we await all of the ceremony to take place, I want us to very quickly go to an interview that was done with Sir Clifford in 2008. At the time, um, he had already retired, um, and I had the uh, good fortune of going to his home and sitting with him. We were actually talking about the election of President Barack Obama. Um, and I want to go to that, to that a portion of that interview very quickly, where he really talks about the future of the Bahamas. He talks about the Bahamas today um, and recognizing some of the problems that we're facing. If we can go to that interview very quickly while before we get into the, to the ceremony at the Western Cemetery. Well, the whole thing in the Bahamas, as many other countries, it starts from your youth, from your home. You have parents who bring you up in, in the right direction. So when you get older in life, you still have some of the parents teaching, and then the schools and the churches. You see, but in the Bahamas today, we don't have that training by parents because many of the homes are single parent and the fathers are nowhere to be found. You see, and the children grow up uh, by themselves, so to speak, because the mothers have to be out there trying to find bread to put on the table for them. So the children grow up uh, by themselves and this is what really happened. And I said this over and over, um, even though I was one, one who fought for independence for the Bahamas. But I think since the Bahamas become an independent nation, um, we lose a lot of things, you know, what the British had. You know, it's uh, things that we should really keep. We just um, turn it away and do our own thing. But the, the upbringing of children in the home is most important. I was telling um, someone, that giving um, some of my friends a story about myself. When I came from Acklands, I did not know any young fellas my age in Nassau until um, I hooked up with a few fellas. And on this Saturday, we went to go to town, downtown. And we went downtown. And um, while we went into the shoe shop, and while one of the fellas talking to the manager, the other fellow was stealing shoes. You see, but I realized then I was in the wrong group because I grew up in a, a home where stealing is, uh, is against the law, the law of man and God, you see. And I just dropped that group of young fellas. But um, 
we need to the young people we need to do more to get a proper training and it start from your home you know true words um, could not have been spoken to late to Clifford Darling in a 2008 interview uh, we're going to swing now to the Western Cemetery our Anthony Newbold is standing by in the ceremony where it appears the funeral procession has arrived and they are attempting now um, to enter that ceremony. Um, Anthony, what can you tell us? Well, Jerome, the procession has indeed arrived here at the cemetery and in a moment the committal service as we watch the Governor General arrive along with Lady Folks, the Prime Minister and Mrs. Ingram, followed by the Deputy Prime Minister, Senators John Delaney, and Minister of National Security Tommy Turnquest. That committal service is about to begin shortly. We are told that the Reverend Dr. Leon Johnson and Carolyn Rowe will preside over this committal ceremony. As we see the leader of the opposition and the deputy leader, former minister, George Smith, Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, Lynn Holowesco, Senators Dwayne Sands and Allison Maynard Gibson, Hope Strawn. Speaker of the House, Alvin Smith, MPs Fred Mitchell, Brenzel Rowe, Carl Bethel, Kenneth Russell, Frank Smith, Cynthia Pratt, Shane Gibson, Ruby Ann Cooper Darling. She was the first woman to register to vote uh, in that historic time. All here inside the cemetery again, the committal service will begin shortly and then Sir Clifford will be interred, as I said to you earlier, within the cemetery and names that we are all familiar with as we see the Prime Minister and other dignitaries above the podium here, just next to the mausoleum of Sir Clifford, as we see the Commissioner of Police and Com Commodore of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force uh, lead their combined groups as they prepare for the final service. Just to Sir Clifford's, the south of Sir Clifford, Mausoleum, Sir Osborne Bancroft, former Chief Justice of the Bahamas, 1946 1951, and to the east, Dr. Wavell Thompson. physician that most Bahamians are familiar with. Surrounded Sir Clifford will be by people like Sylvia and Oscar Johnson, the Reverend Dr. Prince Hebern, former Family Island Commissioner James Campbell, Audley Kemp, again Uriah McPhee, whose death in 1968 occasioned that election that allowed the PLP to firm up, if you will, its grip on power. Sir Victor Sassoon, 
Transfigurations, Reverend Charles Thompson, A.F. Adderley, all those names of persons who've made their own contributions to the development of the Bahamas. On your screen, for those watching television, representatives of the various departments, in this instance, customs, members of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force Rangers, all part of this service where everyone says a final goodbye as we see the Attorney General, Senator John Delaney and others, members of the Honorary Paul Baring crew, Minister Earl DeVoe, Ministers Grant and Cartwright. And in a little while, you will see some members of the lodges to whom Sacliff gave of his time and energy. S.N. Smith among those laid to rest in the Western Cemetery. Again, members we see on your screen. Members of the cabinet and other members of parliament are waiting the start of this committal service for the late Sir Clifford Darling. Governor General, Speaker of the House of Assembly, and Jerome and Patty, I will tell you that he was upset because he thought everybody would know how to be above the fray, as it were. Why couldn't they? He could. As for the job of Speaker, he told me it gave him a headache, <laughs> but he did it anyway as everyone has testified today, Clifford Darling, he would do it because it was for the good of the people. As we watch members of the family make their way to the area where the committal will be held. That group, of course, led by Igrid Lady Darling, along with the other children of Sir Clifford. In just a moment, Reverends Leon Johnson and Carolyn Rowe will take us through this committal service, at the end of which there will be three volleys sounded by the firing party of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. And of course, the last post and reveille will be sounded by the buglers of the police force. 89 years of living 
and making invaluable contributions to his country have finally ended for Clifford Darling, who went as far as any citizen could from the shores of Chester's in the Acklands to Mount Fitzwilliam, Governor General of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Again, members of Sir Clifford's family being seated as we prepare for that final committal service. And the interment of the mortal remains of Sir Clifford in our Snow White mausoleum. Located in the northeastern section of the Western Cemetery here at Nassau and Virginia Streets. On your screen again, representatives of the various government departments, and now members of the family as they prepare for this final of farewells to the fourth Bahamian Governor General. As you could imagine, the walls of the cemetery, as well as the streets and wherever else they can gather in the Western Cemetery, people are here to say goodbye to Sir Clifford Darling. Again, that service of committal to begin shortly. Reverend Leon Johnson and the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Rowe make their way to the front. Let not your heart be troubled. We believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mentions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. the mortal remains of Sir Clifford draped in the colors the Bahamian flag the aquamarine black and gold
being escorted by the combined police force and defense force guard Again, the Reverend T.G. Morrison leading the Bahamian flag, followed by the flags of the Defense Force and the Police Force. And of course, both leading the Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be doubtful, and I count all things but loss. For the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have offered and suffered loss of all things, and do not count them but down, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made comfortable unto his death. If any, if any means, I might attain unto the resurrection of the Lord. For our conversation is in heaven. Also, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our veiled bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the waking whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye may sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. In the pseudo-pigraphal book of wisdom, these words are found. The souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seem in the view of the foolish to be dead, and their passing away was thought of as an affliction. Their going forth from us utter destruction, but they are at peace. For if before men indeed they be punished, yet is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace he proved them, and as a sacrificial offering he took them unto himself. In the time of their visitation they shall shine, and shall dart about as sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with his elect. 
as Christians we find comfort in the witness of sacred scripture. For the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, Yes, the deep things of God. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Let us continue in prayer. Eternal Father, who by thy mighty power didst raise up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Strengthen us now by the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us to worship thee with reverent and submissive hearts and to put our whole trust in thy perfect wisdom, power, and love. Bless us as we read the words of eternal life that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of sacred scriptures we may have hope and be lifted above our darkness and distress into the light and peace of thy presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I heard a voice from heaven say, Cry. What shall I cry? Cry all flesh is grass, and their loveliness is as the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades when the wind of God blows upon it. Surely the people is grass. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. We brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that we can carry nothing out. In the midst of life we are in death. Of whom may we seek for succor, but in thee, O Lord. After labor comes rest. After struggle, peace. After life's fitful fever, this last sleep. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God to receive unto himself the soul of our departed brother, Clifford Darling, we commit his body to Mother Earth from which it was made, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in short and certain hope of the resurrection of the dead, when Christ shall change our vile decaying bodies and shall fashion them like an unto his own glorious body. For it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he our life shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All those who have this hope in Christ Jesus doth purify themselves just as he is pure. And 
I heard a voice from heaven say, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Amen. Yes, says the Spirit, blessed indeed are they, for they rest from their labor and their deeds to follow them. Because we do not know the next among us to succumb to the chilling hand of death, we make our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As we present this family before the Lord one last time, and as we take in the sight, the sounds, the smells of death and dying, we go to God in prayer as led by Deacon Everton Cox. God of mercy, God of grace, God of life, we invoke your presence here this afternoon, dear God. We thank you for the life of Clifford Darling. We thank you for the lives he had touched. We thank you for his family. I now pray, God, that as we come to the end of this exercise, I pray a special blessing upon the family. Lead them and guide them. Let there be no strife among them. May they be an example to the community in times like these, so that others might see and would want to emulate. These favors and blessings we ask, through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. May the God who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he confirm and strengthen you. May he work in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. And may the triune blessing of the triune God, God disclosed his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest rule and abide with you. Abide with those who mourn. Abide with those whom we love. And abide most especially with those who make it difficult for us to love. Amen. Jim Morrison, as we watch the flag being prepared for presentation to Lady Darling, the flag that draped the coffin of Sir Clifford, tell you that we still have three volume volleys to be fired by the firing party of the Royal Bahamas Police Force as they continue preparing that flag for presentation to Lady Darling and of course the last post in Rebelly to be sounded by the buglers of the Royal Bahamas Police Force. As the firing party prepares for the three bodies. brings us just a little closer to the end of this official state funeral for Sir Clifford Darling. Reverend T.G. Morrison, Leon Johnson, the Reverend Dr. Carolyn Rowe, Deacon Yelverton Cox, presiding over this committal service for Sir Clifford.
again the firing party three volleys for the former governor general members of the Bugler's prepare for last post in Reveille. And the flag will be presented to Lady Darling. As we see members of the Prince Hall family, 